No, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined on the line by Paddy McCord. Paddy, how are you getting on? All good, Enda. Uh, keeping keep busy and, and uh, looking forward to the podcast. So I think most people know about your career and how you came to play for Celtic from going from the League of Ireland and going to going to Rochdale and going back to League of Ireland and then finally ending up at Celtic in 08. So I'll take you back to 2008. You're playing for Derry City and you're told that Celtic are interested. Firstly, how are you told and what's your reaction? Well, look, at the time I was playing for, for Derry City, but if the truth be told, I wasn't aware of, of um, Celtic's interest until very, very late. I was actually in England at the time. I was actually at West Brom, you know, going through, uh, you know, transfer talks there and, and contract talks. And on the evening, it sort of it sort of became quite late in the evening and they decided that I would do my medical the next morning. And while I was driving away or while I was still at the, you know, the training ground of West Brom, I got a call or my agent at the time got a call. They say that Celtic had matched the offer of West Brom and, you know, would, would it be a good time to discuss personal terms and that. So my agent was dealing with that once. He told me that, that Celtic had matched the offer and there, and there was a keen interest of, of of me going there. Then, you know, my head was, was turned automatically, as you can imagine. And I was just... Um, Really, really hopeful then that we could get so agreed. Mm. As a player, when there's a club like that that comes in and sort of, I don't know, um, changes your plans entirely, what what's that like? Is it sort of is it, is it a a tough time to get your head around things, or are you just trying to get things done as quickly as possible so that you can focus on the football? Look, to be honest, it was one of them ones where if it had been two clubs that you know were just battling for my signature and I had no sort of allegiance to either, then, you know, we'd have probably sat with your agent and discuss, you know, what what length of contract is there, what, what's the area like they love, you know, how much am I getting paid a week? But none of them thoughts come into my head. As soon as I heard it was Celtic, then automatically I, there was only one place I wanted to go. And, you know, that's, that's certainly no disrespect to West Brom. They were a Premier League team at the time and, I was absolutely ecstatic that ecstatic, sorry, that they were interested in me. But you know, they have that uh, they have that interest from the team you supported. And and for them they actually want to pay money to sign me, then as I said, my head was turned automatically and there's only one place I want to go. Mm. Gordon Strachan was the manager at the time, wasn't he? He was the manager, I but um, you know, I'm not sure how much Gordon was involved in my personal signing. Um when I got there, I was I was very much a fringe player under Gordon in the early part of the season, and you know only made a, a few appearances. But no, listen, I, I got on very well with him, and I still do. And you know, we um, he took a wee bit of time they warned to me, but once he did, he was very good to me. Mm. What's Gordon like? Because there's obviously he's he's a fiery character from the time that he was manager, from the time that he was a player, and uh, I guess still now when he's a pundit, he still has that little bit of wit about him. So. What was he like to, to deal, with, deal with at that point? He's, he's, he's a hard taskmaster. He, he trains the, the lads very hard, and, but the lads all loved him. They all they all thought the world of him. Um, he had brilliant success there. I think maybe undercredited a wee bit the job he done at Celtic, and you know the fans were, you know, I, th- I think most of the fans liked him, but there was an element that that, that never took them for whatever reason, but. No, he, as a character, he's very similar to what you see in TV. Very sharp, very witty. You know, can be can be quite straight and and can be quite strict in terms of you know the demands he puts on the players. But you know, all in all, I, I find him a really good guy. Mm. Two thousand eight. I get. I guess it doesn't seem that far away. But in terms of football, it's a lifetime ago. Really, what's the diet like as a footballer what's the training sessions like at that point like is is it as modern as nowadays or anywhere close to it or is it what, what was it like at Celtic at that point uh, at that point it was probably you know in the in the process of changing and um you know we we Gordon as manager and then after that with Tony Mowbray and, and then Neil Lennon and you know the, the canteen pretty much stayed the same there was you know healthy food without being anything over the top. Um, I then heard after I left that Ronnie Delia had come in and, and changed a lot about the canteen. You know, there was 
very little sauces with meals and they we used to have fuzzy drinks in the canteen that all was was taken away and you know I don't think the lads quite liked it they begin with but you know as time went on I think they they got quite used to it so no look I didn't I didn't look at the, the canteen when I first arrived and thought it was anything over overly dramatic it was you know chicken and pasta and bread and you know stuff that you know most footballers would eat but mm. as I say I heard I heard rumours after that Ronnie Delia come in and changed quite a lot but you know I wasn't there at that time What was the changes or what was the biggest change from Derry City and the, the jump up to, to Celtic? Look the obvious the obvious um, answer to that question would be the quality of player you know if you're talking within within the, the sort of infrastructure of the club the quality of player was was a big jump. We had a really good team at, at Derry, so that, that's not being disrespectful to the players I played with. But you know the quality of player, the quality of you know their their professionalism, how fit they were, how athletic they were. You know all of them were were massive jumps. And then you know outside the club, the um, the difference was just the size of the club. You know you couldn't. I literally couldn't. You know walk down the street or go to a shop or go to an Asda or whatever without. You know, someone wanting to they talk to you or, or have a conversation or have a photo. So, you know, that took about a, a about a, well, I was about to say it took about a time to get used to it. Actually, you don't I don't think you ever get used to it. It's it's pretty full on all the time. But you know, ninety nine percent of the people were were very nice and very complimentary, and I think they just enjoyed you know bumping into a, a Celtic player or a Rangers player of the Rangers fans. So, no, look. Incredible experience for the five years I was there, but you know, pretty intense at the same time. Mm. I'll talk about Glasgow and the rivalry of Rangers maybe later on, but you made your debut against Hibs, was it in 2008? Can you remember what you felt like going onto the pitch the first time for Celtic? Well, I actually made my, my first team debut in a pre season friendly against Man City, which was, although it was a friendly for me, it was, it was still. An incredible feeling. Um, four or five years previous, I'd, I'd been released from Ratchdale as we as we touched on earlier. And you know, you have that self doubt, you have that worry that you know maybe that time's gone now. You might get there a, a good level of football. So even though it was a friendly that evening against Manchester City, they, they step on the pitch at Celtic Park with a three quarter full stadium, and you know with a with a hoops on was was special. And then. I suppose they, they make your league debut against Hubs later on that season. Of course, that's the one that matters. But I still count, believe it or not, that Man City game was my debut because it was a personal thing that I knew I would have an experience for the rest of my life. Mm. Were you nervous? No, I don't think I was particularly nervous. I think the fact that it was a friendly, um, you know, took any nerves away. I uh, remember being excited and I remember... Being honest, I remember having you know thoughts and visions of at that time when I was being released from Ratchdale and thinking, you know, I'm quite proud that I'm, I've now made it back to this level and you know to get on the lot and come on around the 67, 68 minute and got twenty minutes. I actually nearly scored, but uh, no, it was it was um, a fantastic feeling as you can imagine. And, you know, as I say, I didn't get many many first team games that year, so. That was as important to me as the, the sub appearances that I had. Mm. That Celtic team of 07, 08, 09 were probably the first team that I was, you know, properly into as a as a fan, because it was the first time that I was allowed to go to matches by myself and, and stuff like that. So it for me it holds strong strong memories. But in terms of the squad, you know, we've got Arthur Burke, Scott McDonald, Sean Maloney, Aidan McGiddy. What was it like being around those kind of guys? Like did does that bring your level of, of football up when you're playing against playing with quality like that? Absolutely, um, I think that's one of the one of the things you have to try and adapt to very quickly is that the speed of the game moves in a different direction. It, it goes up tenfold. The speed of the players' thoughts that you're playing with is, is a lot quicker. Um, obviously, their fitness levels was was a lot higher than what I was used to. So. When you put all them things under the pot, you have to you really have to up your game, or else you just get left behind. As I say, you mentioned some names there. Aidan McGeady, not only could Aidan dribble and see a pass, he could also finish. He, he, you know, he was a 
fantastic player in that season in particular. You're on about he'd just won all the player of the seasons. He had a fantastic season. Sean Maloney, another brilliant player who got a move to the Premier League. And then he had the likes of Nakamura, who was a magician. So, you know, training with them players daily, you had to up your level or else, look, you, you would have just got left behind and it forces you to, to do that. Who's the leaders in that team? Because it seems like from the outside perspective, probably would have been, you know, Arthur Burke would be one. Gary Cald- Caldwell probably would have been one of, uh, uh, probably later on, 2010 period. But at, at that stage, who were the kind of the standout leaders who were the most vocal? Well, Steve McManus was the captain. I think he got the captaincy a couple of years before that. He was the captain. So he would have been quite vocal. Arthur, to be honest, was, was very quiet. Um, kept himself to himself, done his talking on the pitch. Um, quite happy in his own company. He used to bring his his friends and family over from Poland. They would be up around the training ground and go to the game. So he, he wasn't much of a mixer, to be honest. I, I got on really well with him. Um, but he didn't really mix with anyone outside. He was quite happy in his own surroundings. Gary Caldwell, who you touched on, was was you know a leader within the dress room. And then you had the likes of Paul Hartley, Jan Venegora Hesselink, um, Barry Robson, all big characters. Scott Brown, who's still quite young, but you know still very vocal and, and very much respected within the dress room. So you had a lot of you had a lot of real good pros who. You know, for someone like me at 23, 24 coming in, mm. there was um, plenty of players there to look up to and, and learn from as well. Were you in the dressing room for the scrap between Arthur Burke and Ed McGiddy in the shower? I was there. I had actually started, <laughs> had actually started my training pitch. And, uh, listen, it happens all the time that, that they were having a wee bit of arguing over, I don't know if it was a shot or Arthur thought Aiden should have shot or whatever. And, then Arthur's left the school, sort of ran from, as you can imagine, then it gets broke up in the, in the training ground because we're all there and, and, and people are in the way. So we got in the change room and, and it was, you know, everyone thought it was done and dusted. And Arthur obviously had a lot of other ideas and he's, he's came flying for Aiden again. So again, there was a couple of, there was a couple of blows thrown and, uh, you know, we were, we were able to get on pretty quickly and, and save Aiden's bacon, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, if, if it was to pick two people to go up against each other, Arthur Burke against Aiden McGiddy doesn't seem like the, the fairest of fights, but what's uh, what's been the biggest change in the dressing rooms then? Because that seems to be pretty common in terms of like that 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 era of football. So like does it, that doesn't happen anymore, does it? Or or does it like well, look, I, I I don't be in around the change room as much as I used to as a player. Obviously, on, on match nights and that, you'd be, you'd be in. But again, even that time is very limited because you're in your own office. But look, I'm pretty sure it still happens. Is it as common as it once was? Probably not because, you know, players are different now. And, and, and I say different, I don't mean any softer or any, you know, they don't want to want any less. It's just a different time, a different culture when... When I first went to you know England when I was maybe 17, 16, 17, it was common. It really was common for two of the older pros. They at least go head to head at half time and have to be separate, or, or you know, sometimes it does spill over on and they blows or but look, as time went on, the, the incident that we spoke about, you know, with Aiden and, and Arthur did become far less and less. You still had arguments, you still had heated discussions, but the actual um the actual, you know, fisticuffs or, or actual physical fights were, you know, less frequent. And, and I can imagine that's probably still the same now. People have different ways of, of dealing with falling outs. Mm. How good was Aidan McGeady? Because he was probably one of my favourites playing for Celtic. And I guess everything you read about him, that he was he was as good as he came across in the pitch. So like, was he out, out, out of this world at that point? He was. Look, he, he had just... Tomorrow, the season before I came, he'd just come back off the back of, you know, he's probably his best season in a Celtic shirt. He'd loads of goals, loads of assists, won all the player of the years, uh, loads of interest from other clubs, not just in England, but in Europe. And he had an unbelievable season. That season, my first season, he didn't have a great season. Him and Gordon, for some reason, you know, had a few fallen outs. He was under the team. He seemed to just 
whatever it was, you know, it was a strange one for me because I'm looking at him going, you know, what's going on here? Six months ago, this lad was the, the best player in the, in the country and one of the best young talents in the UK and all of a sudden they can't get in the team. Seemed to be a bit of a personality clash, um, but whatever happened, uh, he just didn't have a great year that year. Gordon left, Tony Mowbray came in and he, and he started the season flying and, and had a, although the team wasn't doing that great, Aiden was was back playing really well again. He, he seemed happy. And then, you know, obviously Spartite Moscow came in with a, a huge offer that that uh, enticed him to go and play in Russia for a few years. And look, I always rated him as a player. I always got on great with him as a lad too. He was, he was a funny lad. He was really welcoming to me when I first came to the club, you know, just to go out to his house and all that. And, but as a player, he was absolutely fantastic. A baldy like you've never seen before. He, he could go by him and he, he had pace. He could slow someone up, take him the outside, take him the inside. He just had unbelievable ability. And, you know, as as time went on, and especially as he got older at Celtic, he started adding goals, assists, and became one of the key men in, in, in the league, really, before he left. You were sort of in and out of the team at this point, playing a good bit of reserve football as well. Is that frustrating for you, even now, or can you remember what you what you felt like back then, not getting as much first team football as you might have liked? No, because you know I've been very open and honest about my conditioning wasn't what it should have been the first year I was at Celtic. You know, I came from the League of Ireland that came off a long term injury, and it took me a, a long time to get up to speed. I, I broke down a few times and in training while I was at Celtic, so that set me back. So. Look, I was fully prepared. That there was no way I was walking straight into that first team. You know, I'd never had that, you know, ambition. I never had that want when it when I signed. I knew there was going to be a period where of adaption, so to speak. So I had to get further. I had to get better. And I used the first year to do that. And the reserves helped me because you know I was getting games. I was doing quite well. I started to build a wee bit of a profile. And then, you know, the second year then, I, I really only count the second year as when I would class myself as a, you know, a, a first team player. I was more of a reserve player and, you know, as we put on getting the odds, some appearance here and there. But, you know, it was really only my second year where I had a full pre-season, played most of the pre-season games and then, you know, was involved right the, right the way out the, the season. And then, like you said, Tony Mowbray takes over from Gordon Strachan. Does that sort of throw things up up in the air a little bit for yourself and for the other players as well. What was that change like? Um I think I think we, we, we sort of knew we were about two months ago in the season that Gordon was leaving. You know, you, you sort of hear these things um, you know, around the dressing room, lads that we he would have been close to the likes of Gary Caldwell and Paul Hartley and that they'd have been very close with him and I don't know if he told them or or they just got the sense that you know, the way he was speaking or whatever, it was going to be his last year. So, and that turned out to be the case. Um, There's a lot of names linked with a job, as you can imagine. But, you know, when Tony got the job, I was quite excited because, you know, only a year previous, he was the one that was trying to sign me at West Brom. So, you know, I knew he liked me as a player. And when he came in, I was a bit nervous because of, you know, what had happened about, turning down West Brom at the last minute to go to Celtic. But mm-hmm. first week he was in, he's called me in his office. He said, Paddy, look, I'm delighted you're here. Whatever's happened. He said, that's football. He said, I would have probably done the same myself if Middlesbrough had it came on for me because I, I think he was a Middlesbrough supporter. And he said, look, get the head down now. Good pre-season. You're part of my plan. So, you know, that was a great weight off my shoulder. And it was, you know, it was brilliant to hear that from him. There was no hard feelings, which I didn't expect there to be anyway because... He's not that type of man. He's a, he's a fantastic man, a, a really, really nice man. And, you know, I was just delighted that he seen me as being a part of his plans. Mm. What went wrong for Tony at the club? I remember a lot of players coming in. Was that disruptive or was, was he just not at the level needed for Celtic? Or what went wrong for Tony? Um, I wouldn't label him not being at the level for Celtic. Tony's done some fantastic jobs at at all our clubs. I think the fact that, you know, Gordon was leaving after three or four seasons, three or four very successful seasons. Um, Tony had come in, a few players 
had wanted to leave with Gordon like they, they did do then. They, they went with him then to Middlesbrough when he got the job. And, you know, there was a period where there was a lot of change at the club. Um, Tony tried to bring in his, his own players who took a while to settle. They weren't bad players by any means, but they didn't have the ground running, you know. And then in January, the, the club sort of backed them to go and get the likes of Robbie Keane and, and Kamara and stuff. And, you know, the results didn't really pick up instantly. And unfortunately, it's a, when you're at a club like Celtic, it's a, you know, you have to win straight away. You have to be competing straight away. And it doesn't look like we were going to that season. And, you know, unfortunately, Tony lost his job. But as I say, I, I found him really good with me. And, you know, he's been a brilliant manager at our clubs. It just didn't work out at Celtic. Yeah, and I think Rangers had done, or Celtic had done three in a row previously, and then Rangers did three in a row. This was obviously before the situation where Rangers turned really badly, but what was the rivalry with Rangers at that point? Because it seemed like it was really at a peak and at a strong point before that. Well, you know, the, the three years previous before I came, you know, being a fan, you could see that it was nip and tuck every season. You know, Celtic was, was popping them maybe in the last day or the last couple of games and the rivalry was fierce and then that continued for the next few years. The only difference was Rangers started they they sort of pop Celtic and you know and then obviously as you touched on there the they had their well documented money issues and, and, and went out of the, the league. But look at that rivalry as is what it is. It's never going to change. Um it's a unique rivalry in, in my opinion. It's the most intense and fierce that I've ever experienced, you know, well, that's been playing or coaching. And it's, um, it's a special, special day. It's a special, special week in the lead up to the game. You know, you can feel the tension around in the city. You speak to people and they're, they're nervous wrecks really because their, their mood for the next two, three weeks is going to depend on that 90 minutes. And, you know, loving in the city was, was really intense about that time, you know? Mm. Yeah. Suffocating would be the, word that would come to come to mind for me. I don't know if you felt that. Look, it was you tend to not really go out that much that week, you know, whether it's before or after the game. You just suffocating now, it's a good word because, you know, you, you literally couldn't go anywhere and, and people were talking about it and they, they loved to remind you about you know, how important it was and, you know, we better beat these so and so's at the weekend and and that the, the pressure was was huge anyway. But the thought of meeting that same fella the next week in the shop again, if he had a loss or whatever, and knowing that he's you've let him down and potentially ruined his, his week and he's had again to work to his you know, fan or his friends that potentially Rangers fans, the bragging rights and all that. That it was huge pressure and you know, being from, from Derry and myself and and knowing what that was like from a young age, it was uh, it it was exactly what I thought it was be intense and the real a real rivalry and a real sort of hatred, you know, that there's no getting away from both sets of fans hate each other and, and that's just the way it is. Mm. Does that seep through into the dressing room? Does it like even to the players outside of like, I know yourself, you come from Derry, you obviously know what I mean. So like the players who wouldn't have grown up with that, wouldn't have not really known, does it seep through to them as well? It doesn't take long before they know. Um, you know, you only have to live in a city for a week or two and you can sense it, you can smell it. Um, you only have to talk to two or three people and they, they tell you what it means. I for, I didn't need told, but you know, some of the foreign lads that come in that maybe underestimate the rivalry, maybe don't understand it completely, they get it very quickly, you know, and then they're told in the dressing room as well. And you can see how nervous they get then leading into the games. They're probably the worst ones because they've never experienced it before. They don't really know, you know, how big it is and, until people remind them and tell them and then you know, as I say, they, they don't belong getting it. Mm. I spoke to Darren O'Day about him six months ago, maybe a year ago, and his biggest memory of the games and playing in an old firm game is not being able to hear and barely able to, being able to hear his own teammates talk to him during the game. What's your feelings when you play in that in, in that type of game? Well, I could hear the manager pretty clearly because I was usually <laughs> sitting six feet from him. You know, but no, I understand. I understand what he says. Um, the noise is something that you'll never experience. You know, it, it's so noisy. Um, and it's like, 
you know, some games you play, it might be noisy at the start, then there's a wee break, you know, and then it picks up again after a goal or a, a series of attacks. This is just constant for 90 minutes. There's no let up. There's no breather. Um, I, I understand what Darren's saying. You're so caught up in the game. You're so focused that you don't really hear anything other than the noise. Um, I don't think you particularly hear any chants or any singing. It's just this loud volume of, of, of noise and you know, you can smell the hatred in the atmosphere. It's it's a really unique football experience that you know any player that, that ever gets lucky enough to experience it will always talk about it for the rest of their career. I remember at the time, obviously Celtic had a bit of a follow period when Rangers were were playing in that in that stage. And Neil Lennon takes over as the first team manager from Tony Mowbray. And one of the themes was he's gonna bring the thunder back, gonna bring the you know, a bit of a joy back to Celtic Park. What, what's your memories of Neil Lennon as the manager uh, when he first took over? I will. I remember that interview. You know, and it's one now that uh, that sort of symbolises his first time in charge. You know, I remember the words he said. I'm going to bring the thunder back. Is exactly what he said. And to be fair to him, he did. Um, you know, I suppose it coincided with with, with Rangers having their tr- their own troubles and. And people would always argue, oh, they get an easy run at the league and the easy run at the Cups. But it's far from it because at Celtic, you're always competing against every team. Every team raises their game they play. It's incredibly difficult. They won titles. It's incredibly difficult. They won Cups. And, you know, Neil's record will always say that he managed to do that repeatedly as a player and a manager. So, you know, he came on. It was his first real job in management. And you know, we've done a very good job. We won we won plenty of titles and he certainly brought the thunder back. It was some unbelievable atmospheres around that time, you know. I remember the place jumping and that song, you know, that that song was going uh, You just can't time. get enough of that, was it? That just can't get enough, you know. Remember the place bunching at that sixty two thousand and you know, the, the thunder was well and truly brought back. I have to give it to him that way. What was he like as a manager at that point? He was very tough, you know, doesn't hold back if he had something to say, he said it. Um, had a dressing room that could take it, you know, take it on the chin and, 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 and take it the way it was meant. He didn't mean to, you know, make anyone feel bad, but if someone wasn't performing or he felt the team as a whole was underperforming, then by all means, he let us know, you know, he, he could get very angry at times. And he could get very, you know, personal with players and, and, and tell them that that ain't going to be accepted here. You know, in his own words, it was a lot, it wasn't as nice as what I'm telling you. But he, um, no, listen, but had great success, had a dressing room that, w- that would have went through a brick wall for him. And I think he realised that, you know, if I need to have a pop at these lads, then they can take it. Um, now watching, you know, from the outside, I, I see he's a lot, well, it was as a manager. He, he seemed to take a lot of pressure off the players, you know, trying to, trying to. Whereas before, you know, I think it had been more aggressive towards the players. But as I say, it's very hard to judge. I'm only, I'm only looking from a fan. I've got no inside info. I, uh, the players I still speak to, I don't speak to them about football. Um, they're just my friends now. So, you know, at that time, he's very fiery, same as a player, very aggressive, but. You know, wanted the best for Celtic and, and demanded that the players wanted that too. Were you in the squad for the 2012 game against Barca? Were we won? Yeah. Yeah, I was on the bench. I didn't get on, unfortunately. But What was it like? What, what, actually, what's it like being in um, in a squad like that when you don't actually, when, you, when you're not playing in the first team, would you, you come out with a result, result like that? Oh, look, I was on the bench and, you know, I was hoping to get on like I was, you know, in, in other games I was on the bench. Look, the way the game went, we were tuning all up, um, going really well, they get a little goal back and, you know, then it's sort of back to the wall. So I, I sort of knew then I, I probably wouldn't be getting on. But look, I was like a fan. I was still engrossed, you know, on, you know, this is unbelievable. Um, I'm pretty sure in years to come that Barcelona team will be mentioned in the, the same breath as, you know, the great Ajax teams 
the great AC Milan teams, you know, that'll be up there. The great Barcelona teams that, that will be named in that bracket. So to be involved in a team that, you know, you can always turn around and say, well, well we beat them on the night, although I didn't play, it was was still a special, special experience. I would have loved to get on the pitch, but unfortunately it just wasn't to be on the night, but still amazing they beat such a talented team. I was looking at your stats there now. Some of these stats websites are not completely accurate. Ten goals in total you scored? I'm not sure. Look, I've seen ten, I've seen eleven, I've mm. seen nine. Um, I, I, I don't know. Them. I wouldn't be big for, for stats about myself. I could tell you stats about other players, but not about myself. A lot of them are iconic and you know they've been replayed and replayed. And it seems like you scored a lot more because they're so iconic and because of the way that they were they were scored. Like, do you think that you should have been playing more for Celtic? Like in the end, do you think your talent warranted maybe playing playing a bit more and getting more opportunities to do it? Because from my memory, you were probably one of the most talented players I've ever seen in terms of sheer ability. So I, I, I'm interested to hear what you what you thought. Look, I do believe I should have played more. Um, I don't blame anyone for that. You know, I, I take blame for that. I, I wasn't. I wasn't always fit. I wasn't always injury free. I had injury problems. Um, I think the the fitness issue got dragged out a bit too much. You know, when I when I first came, I was really unfit, and that seemed to stick with me for the five years. It certainly wasn't the case. You know. I was never as fit as Scott Brown or, 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 or Barry Robson, for instance, but I was fit enough to last games. I was fit enough to play games. I've done that regularly. Um, I think people maybe look for excuses of, of why I wasn't playing more regularly, and that was the easy one to come up with. But mm. as I say, I was fortunate to spend five years at the club I supported. I could play 95 or 100 appearances, as you say, 10, 11 goals, won five trophies. So, it's not something that, that keeps me awake at night. It's not something that, you know, I give too much thought to. I, I, I'm the type of person where I'm, I'm always glass half full anyway, so I, I tend to, you know, think of the good times and the good memories I have at Celtic and not to get caught, sorry, not get too caught up in, on the, the thought of, you know, should I have played more or should I have scored more and all that. I might just ask you about current Celtic stuff before we finish up then. This season from a Celtic fan perspective, probably one of the worst in memory. So what, what did you think went wrong? Yes, look, it was a, it was a, it was a poor season from start to finish, really. Um, didn't, didn't, didn't get going. I think we won our first game five or six, one, and, you know, people are thinking this is great, but this season, um, there's a huge pressure with 10 in a row. That you know nearly turned on the you know a bit of an obsession for for all of us really, and then when that looked as if it wasn't going to happen, then I think too. And uh, look, maybe I'm wrong, but there was a lot of anger with some people as well with the lockdowns and the, you know the pandemic. And sometimes I think that's spilled over under football because some of the stuff you know that we were seeing about the protests and all. I don't think in a normal year that would have happened. I just think there was a real a lot of tension with a 10 in a row, a lot of anger with a pandemic and the lockdown and frustration and, you know, and and look, it was just some scenes weren't, weren't great, let's be honest. Um, mm. Not going to have a go with anyone. There's reasons for that. Um, wouldn't like to see them again if we can help it because I don't think it does any good. But, no, just a, just a poor season. For a season that promised so much and, and what could have been so great Certainly didn't deliver, but look, it's football. It happens. The manager's lost his job because of it. And there's a new manager in there now who has a huge job. They have a look now and assess the squad he has. The squad he has left. And and then hopefully he can add some quality to it that, you know, we get back challenging, you know, sooner rather than later. Mm. The similarities between yourself and Shane Duffy are quite so obvious because, you know, Derry City... Celtic fans growing up off the club. Could you empathize with what was going on with Shane this year? Do you think the fact that he was a boyhood Celtic fan, there was a lot made of that. Obviously, he had his own personal issues as well with his father passing away. 
like, like do you think the the pressure of coming from a city like Derry that has the obvious links with Celtic added to what went wrong for Shane? So I, I absolutely love Shane. You know, I love him as a person. I love him as a player. He's been a fantastic player in the Premier League in England. He's been a fantastic player for the Republic of Ireland. And look, he did lose his father and he went to his boyhood club. And he tried his best. He, he, he actually had a really good start. He scored a few goals. And then he made a few mistakes. And, and to be honest, he was criticised, you know, a bit over the top, in my opinion. In fact, I thought it was a good bit over the top. There was other players who were underperforming and, and making mistakes. And I think the Celtic fans just had such high hopes for Shane, you know, thinking that he was going to be this, you know, Paul McGrath type, you know, top-class centre-back. They take us on to the next level and lead us to 10 in a row and, Again, going back to the protests and stuff like that, I think when that didn't happen, there was a real frustration. And you know, Shane did. You know, he took a lot of a lot of stick, which a lot of it was unfair, or, or certainly it wasn't just him that was causing the team to underperform. So, look, Shane's a big he's a he's a big boy. He'll take it on the chin. Um, he he had personal issues, you know, around that time that I'm sure he's he's hopefully overcoming now as well. So. Look, he tried it. He gave it his best shot. And, you know, he was just unfortunate that it was a season where not much went right, to be honest. Mm. Well, he's back in the Irish side as well. He was really good against um, Andorra. So hopefully that'll be the start of him kicking kick and start his career again. Because, I mean, I think everyone did expect him to be brilliant. And having seen him for Ireland, I mean, he is, he is a top class player. So it was just weird that it just didn't seem to happen for him as Celtic at all. So just finishing up then, Andre Postacoglu, I'm sure like many people, you haven't been watching the J-League for the last five, six years. So what are your hopes for him? No, you're right. I haven't been watching it. But, you know, since he was linked with a job, I've, I've you know, tried to dig up as much research about him as I can. And, and I've read interviews that, you know, well-respected people in, in Asia and, and Australia, you know, speak very highly of him. I hope he he comes in and implements his, his style on the team. Firstly, I think he needs help. He needs players. Um, we've lost a lot of loan signings. Probably weren't up to the level anyway, so I don't think it's a huge loss. Um, his job now is to replace the, the players that we've lost. We, we're hopefully better. And then, you know, he needs some time to, to work with the players that he gets in, you know, along with the existing one that's there. They, come up with a system and come up with a style of play that first and foremost is hopefully going to win games and you know secondly if you can add a bit of flair and a bit of quality to that that the fans you know can can relate to then you know who knows it could be a great success but I just don't know I don't know enough about him they, they, they comment I don't know what players he's going to get in um, but the one thing you'll get is like all of the Celtic supporters or sorry all the Celtic managers and you get my full support and you know hopefully I really really hope it goes and does well let's hope so Paddy been absolutely brilliant with your time thanks very much no problem Amber